Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for joining us today for this beautiful spring evening at America House. My name is Mariana Hulevich. I'm events coordinator here. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to see you here uh, at this uh, very cool event that we uh, jointly organized with the PFP alumni. Uh, this is the exchange program, which is sponsored by the US government. And the theme of our today's event is there is no planet B. And I'm sure that here we have uh, people who care about our planet and who care about our future. Uh, let me please uh, introduce uh, speakers of our discussion uh, first. So here we have uh, American experts as well as Ukrainian ones. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Christopher uh, Lipman, who is the Director of Financial Control, uh, Cook Country Department of Environmental Control, Chicago, Illinois, uh, United States. And his focus area uh, is environmental control, regional environmental policy, waste and recycling, and sustainability. Uh, also, we have um, Andrina Konechny here, who is the alumnus of the Professional Fellows Program. He has PhD in law, uh, and he works at the Secretariat of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. And his focus area um, is the state policy in the field of ecology, land use, and energy efficiency. Um, um, Elizabeth Judson, who is the Director of Program Management, Elevate Energy Chicago, Illinois, United States, and her focus area is sustainable renewable energy, energy policy and programs, energy efficiency and energy conservation. And uh, Olesa Shapovalova, who is the alumni of the Professional Fellows Program, and she works at the Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources of Ukraine. And her focus area is ecology, ozone layer protection, climate change, and sustainable energy. Uh, let's welcome our speaker, speakers once again with a warm uh, round of applause. <laughs> and I think we will give the floor to the moderator or the first speaker. Um, how are we decide? Yeah. So good evening. Thank you for having us here. Uh, this is our second night in America House uh, for a couple of us. Um, we were here last night talking on waste issues, which factor into this a bit as well. Um, I am with our Cook County Environmental and Sustainability Department. Um, just for a quick background. Um, there we go. So Cook County is the second largest county um, in the United States. So um, kind of geographically how we're broken up in the U.S., we have 50 states. Those are broken up into counties. Um, Cook County, which encompasses the city of Chicago, uh, the third largest city in the U.S., uh, um, inside the second largest county in the U.S. Um, a couple of the things we're known for in Chicago, uh, the Sears Tower once was the largest or tallest building in the world. I think now it's like fourth or fifth. Um, our transportation system, the L we call it, because it's elevated above the ground. Um, our beautiful Lake Michigan, which is um, one of the largest freshwater um, lakes in the world. Um, also former President Barack Obama from Chicago, although we had a debate earlier that he's actually from Hawaii, but he, he got his political career started in Chicago, so we claim him. Um, also in Chicago, we have a large Ukrainian population. We actually have a neighborhood uh, called Ukrainian Village, which you see down here on the right bottom. Um, that's a view along Western Avenue of some of the buildings in Ukrainian Village, a lot of uh, two, three flat buildings, condos, apartments, and whatnot. So a little bit about me. Um, I have a business background and environmental background, uh, master's in business administration with concentrations in sustainable management and economics. I've been both in the public sector and private sectors, um, focusing on environmental issues. And I'm a lifelong Chicagoan. So I've been there my whole life, um, raised my family there, and I'm uh, very proud of our city. So just real quick, um, Cook County ha is very similar actually um, to Kiev here. In the larger metropolitan area, there's about 8 million people. 5.7 million in the county, um, with about two and a half of those inside, or 2.7 million of those inside the actual city of Chicago. So in Cook County, um, we don't necessarily control what people do 
um, sustainable uh, practices necessarily. But we have taken a lot of actions to be sustainable ourselves. So the county has um, approximately 500 buildings, including jails, hospitals, administrative buildings, public health centers. Um, so we've really focused internally to reduce our own carbon emissions um, and then hopefully bring that out into the community um, as an example of things that governments could do and people can do in their homes. So this is our Cook County Board President down here, Tony Preckwinkle. Um, and basically, we have established a greenhouse reduction gas goal um, to reduce our greenhouse gases of our own county operations by 80% by 2050. So obviously, that's a goal really far out. Um, so we do have some intermediary goals there to make sure we're in progress to meet those. Um, so first and foremost, we're a regulatory agency. We were founded in the 70s. Um, back when a lot of U.S. regulation was happening around um, clean air, clean water, um, and land um, use, especially waste, hazardous waste um, focused. So we have typical issues that everywhere in the world has um, with air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, and obviously we're extremely concerned about climate change um, and the effects all of these have on climate. So just a little bit of our organizational chart. You know, again, you see focus here, um, our land section, which handles waste, contaminated properties, um, our air section, which is, uh, you know, pollutants from uh, facilities, industrial facilities, commercial facilities that obviously have um, some sort of pollution that they emit into the air. Um, demolition and asbestos. So when you remove asbestos from a building, we regulate that to make sure that, you know, it's not impacting the health of those inside the building or in the surrounding area, as well as demolition, um, which we regulate both the actual demolition of the building and then where that waste goes to. So we have an ordinance that requires that 70% of all demolition debris be recycled. Um, we actually far exceed that. Usually we see about 95%, and this is actually forward-facing. So this is anyone who demolishes a building within Cook County has to meet this. This is not just for county buildings. Um, we also do air monitoring. So we monitor for certain air pollutants um, to be sure, you know, basically to monitor what our levels of ozone are, CO2, things like that, um, particulate, things that can affect um, the population, especially people who you know, might have issues with asthma, the elderly, young children who are particularly susceptible um, to bad air quality. And I'm sorry, I'm going to skip through a lot of slides here because we want to have more of a discussion afterwards. Um, so we've done a lot of presentations while we've been here in Kiev. Um, and this one's kind of geared to more of our longer presentation. So bear with me if I skip through some of these and you see something that you want to discuss further, save it for the conversation afterwards, and we'll make sure to get to that. So just again, um, real quick on the regulatory front. In the U.S., um, the way things pretty much work is the federal government will create laws um, through Congress. The state will implement those laws and are required to basically enforce at least the law as stringent as that. Often states and local governments will um, add additional layers of regulation on those, which kind of makes sense because if you think about it, we're a very, very large land mass. Um, issues that they have in Idaho might not be the same issues we have in Illinois. Um, you know, certain people have, you know, more issues with industry, um, where other people might have, you know, more issues with mining and things like that. So the regulations can vary from state to state. But at the very least, they have to be at least as stringent as the federal law. So we have at least some things in common um, across borders in the U.S. So that's just a kind of summary of the state. Um, just real quick to get an idea, this entire state of Illinois is about 11 million people, 8 million of which live in approximately the area inside where I'm using the pointer right now. So you can see there's a large population concentration in the northeast which obviously means we have a lot of issues as far as energy use, um, environmental issues as far as air pollution, land pollution, things like that to deal with. It's a little bit of our staff. And so, like I said, I'm gonna skip through some of this. Real quick, um, our air monitoring program, we do um, have several of these stations throughout Cook County, where at the top here, you see these are where we basically take in air, 
look at pollutants. Um, some are relayed back immediately to our laboratory um, through a telemetry system. Others, we actually have to go out every so often and retrieve filters. And from that information, you know, we get ideas of concentrations of pollutants in the air and whatnot. Um, we're pretty transparent with a lot of that information. There is a website, um, AirNow, which residents can go on and see what the air quality is that day. Um, helps them make decisions, hopefully, on to drive less, maybe not to mow their lawns, um, as well as if, if they do have those respiratory issues, maybe to stay inside that day or take other precautions to make sure that they're not affected by poor air quality. So sustainability, which I think we want to delve a little more into tonight. Um, obviously, the regulatory is very important. I mean, so when we talk about, you know, no plan B, you know, obviously, if we're kind of acutely killing ourselves with pollution and things like that, that's pretty serious. But we also want to look at the long term and how we can, you know, create a cleaner planet, a better planet for our children, our children's children, um, and also mitigate the effects of the things we've already done. So real quick, here's a page from our 2017 um, sustainability report. Now, again, this is internal to the county. There are some forward-facing programs here that we do out in the communities, um, but you'll see in 2017, we reduced our own county level um, greenhouse gas emissions by 19%. A lot of this was done by energy efficiency, so um, in our own buildings, we, you know, um, contracted with companies who came in and would give us guaranteed energy savings. So if we did certain projects, they guaranteed we would save so much on our electric bills, um, and that way we actually save money through the, implementing those projects. And a lot of these were smart things that even you could do at home. You know, when you replace a light bulb, replace it with an energy efficient light bulb. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go throw out the light bulb immediately that you already have, but to make smart decisions when you actually go out and make those changes. If you change a water faucet, you know, do it to a low flow water faucet, things like that. Um, this page is actually a little dated. I'm going to look at my phone right now. I'm not checking my Instagram. Um, but <laughs> things have slowed down a little bit. Um, in 2018, or for our 2018 report, which actually reflects 2017 numbers, um, we were only able to reduce those emissions by about 9%. And again, a lot of that comes from we did these energy projects early on, so we had large decreases um, early on in the project. So, um, But we also saved taxpayers... Um, let's see, approximately $6.8 million since 2010 in our county energy bills. So obviously anything we pay for our buildings are paid for through taxes. So that's a big savings to the taxpayer, um, but also reflects savings that they could have in their own lives if they want to um, do these sorts of implementations. Um, to do this, we basically focused internally. Um, we looked at big departments that have some sort of influence on how much energy we're using. Um, so we looked a lot at our asset management people, um, so kind of our building landlords, um, our sheriff's department who controls most of the fleet in um, our fleet being vehicles, um, in our operations, our health system, because obviously health is a very large um, energy impactive um, business. Finance is always important. Who's going to pay for these things and what's our payback going to be for these projects? So you'll see here kind of the intermediary goals um, in 2035 to reduce our emissions from transportation by 40 percent, um, from building energy by 50 percent, and also to reduce our waste by 50 percent. And then the longer term goal to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions from all of these by 80 percent. And actually this has been updated a little bit um, recently. Um, we actually have a 100% net neutral goal right now for all of our building use, so not necessarily transportation um, yet at this point, but we do want our buildings to be um, carbon neutral by 2050, and we'll do that through different means, um, whether it's solar installations, other renewable installations, and then just green purchasing of energy. So that's just kind of graphically, you know, where we, how we're going to get to 2050, the blue being our building energy, which is, you know, our greatest greenhouse gas contributor, um, at least for our operations. You'll see here, too. So this is our goal line, this gray line. Um, we have far exceeded that. So it looks like we're going to do way, way better. Um, that's actually not the case. Um, this is what we call low-hanging fruit here, um, things that were really obvious to do. So we did them early on, and we could get a big bang for our buck. Um, early on. So what we'll start to see is 
we'll kind of start to see a return to this goal line over the years. And this chart actually reflects that a bit. Um, these are realized savings that you know we've already implemented. Um, these are things we know we can do through capital improvements. Um, but kind of the big trick is this box over here, um, determining what kinds of things we can do in the future, which are really going to rely on future technologies, um, you know, maybe political decisions on reducing operations or something like that to reduce our greenhouse gases. But that's the tricky part. Um, we have a few years to figure it out, but um, we, we need to start seeing solutions for those now. And actually, we've even reduced this box so far. If you look at our 2018 chart, um, it's a bit smaller because we have been able to find um, some different savings. So here's just an example of some of the projects we did. Um, one of the really interesting ones is um, these tree. Oh, nope, they're up here. Um, solar trees. So we put them in the parking lots of our courthouses. So these are good for a couple of reasons, obviously. Um, we don't lose any land space because they're off the ground. Um, but we also, um, it, sh it shades cars in the summertime. So it's really great if you get to park under one of these and your car is not all hot in the afternoon when you get back to it. Um, we also put in some EV charging stations. So here you can see one of our little solar trees. Um, and we also have our charging station there. Um, and I want to say we've had about 700 charges um, in a year on these. Uh, what? 117 electric vehicle drivers um, use Cook County charging stations in 2017. And these are like at courthouses and our highway facilities. So not like really popular places where you would expect people with electric vehicles to show up. Um, so these are county employees um, and maybe some members of the public who are showing up and actually using these things. Um, so you can only imagine how well they would do if they were in a more public area that would be a little more popular for this sort of thing. Um, these are pretty cool too, the uh, solar thermal walls that we put in our highway facilities. So you have water going through these. Um, they also generate electricity from the solar, so that's a really cool project. And again, I'm going to sneak through some of this one because Elizabeth is going to talk about it, and then we'll have some discussion on it. But I think um, a lot of the things that you know we want to talk about, too, are what we do in the community. And again, it's really hard um, for us in government because we haven't exactly figured out ways to make people respond or sustainable. Um, regulatory ways, it was real easy to say you have to stop polluting. One, it was real easy for someone to say, do you, do you see that nasty smoke coming out of that smokestack? You probably don't want to breathe that, so we should make a regulation to say that we need to limit that. Where sustainability is a little bit harder to see. Um, you know, we're talking results of which we'll, you know, we'll see over decades, even though some we are seeing acutely right now. Um, a lot of these, you know, are going to be exacerbated over several years, and in some ways, people won't even notice them. Um, you know, as our storms get, you know, stronger and stronger, you know, my kids being born now just kind of feel like that's what storms are, right? They're just strong, you know, storms. They don't remember that we used to just have nice little rains that didn't cause river flooding throughout the entire area. Um, so we do a number of things um, in that regard. Connecting Cook County is a really great one. Our transportation plan. Um, I'm not exactly sure how your transportation works in Kiev, but um, I would say, you know, looking at, at kind of your public transportation, how it's fragmented, right? There's different people who kind of run the trains and some of the different bus lines. Um, ours is similar, uh, except our roads actually sometimes can be controlled by several different government organizations. So when a road runs through a municipality, that town might be in charge of the road. And then when it goes outside of that municipality, the county might be in charge of that road. And then it goes a little further, and the state might be in charge of that road. And if it's a highway, the federal government might be in charge of part of that road. Um, so kind of coming up with comprehensive plans, um, both in you know, our, our roads, but also um, you know, our public transit to make sure that it's cohesive, that it makes sense to where our population's moving, um, that it makes sense with our economic plans and where our economic development's happening. Um, and, 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 you know, basically that we're connected efficiently, which has a huge impact on the economy uh, or not on, on sustainability. If you think about it, in the U.S. at least, vehicles are a huge part of this. And unless we figure out our vehicle issue, we can do everything we want as far as building energy use and everything like that. But pollution from vehicles and fossil fuel use from vehicles is just a huge issue um, that we really need to do something about. 
So another one we have, and Elizabeth will talk about this a little bit more, so I won't go too far into it, but we've had several programs for community solar, um, a lot of which are funded by federal grants. Um, and this is where we just, you know, go out and people can't put solar on their rooftop if you live in an apartment building necessarily. So community solar um, allows a developer to install solar panels, um, you know, possibly on top of a larger commercial building or industrial building, possibly on flat land in a parking lot, solar trees like we have. Um, and then let's those residents who can't put it on their rooftop buy into that um, and, and get their energy from that. The electricity doesn't come directly from that solar to their home, but it goes back into the system and they've contributed to, um, you know, increasing the percentage of renewable energy um, that we're doing. So, um, you know, climate resiliency is another thing we look at. Um, obviously, these things don't have borders. So in Cook County, we have about 131 municipalities. We have several rivers that run through the area. And um, one thing we know is if you develop some sort of stormwater system up in this municipality, it doesn't, it might affect the municipality down here. So if I install some sort of levee along the river, all it's going to do is push that water farther down. So we really need a more regional plan for things like flooding, um, which we have big issues with in the Chicago area. And we know they're going to get worse because of climate change. You know, even if we get things turned around here in the next couple years, we're still going to deal with the problems that we've already kind of brought upon ourselves. Um, energy efficiency, again, Elizabeth's going to talk a lot about that. Um, waste planning, though. So we have no open landfills in Cook County. We also do not incinerate our trash. So we send all of our trash between 40 and 200 miles away. Um, obviously, this has a huge environmental impact just from the transportation of this material um, around the state. Um, but then also, since most of what we do is landfill it, um, there's also the impact of greenhouse gases that are generated from landfill use. <clears throat> so we, we have a five-year plan um, in place that we look at every five years to kind of try to increase diversion in the area. So as the government, we don't pick up trash. We, um, that's usually um, delegated to private agencies and handled at the municipal level. But again, it's one of those things we need to look at the broader picture of what we can do to get citizens um, more engaged in recycling um, and just overall reduction of the materials they use in the first place. So Elizabeth's going to talk about community solar, so I'm going to flip through that. Um, just the last quick program I want to talk about, um, and this is actually a program for remediating sites that we've kind of already messed up. Um, it's called our Brownfield Program. Uh, so historically industrial sites that we think might have contamination on them. Um, we received a grant from the federal government about five years ago um, to assess several of these sites. So it's a $600,000 grant. It seems, you know, $600,000 at U.S. dollars would be a nice chunk of change for me. Um, it's really a drop in the bucket um, compared to what we would need to clean up all the industrial waste that's been you know, poured into our ground over the years, leaking storage tanks, gas stations, um, sites like that. So it's real important for us to redevelop these um, properties for a number of reasons. One being um, we tax um, in Illinois based on property, so we tax property. Um, these properties have no value to them, so they're not really contributing anything to the to the tax roll. They also create blight in communities. No one wants to live next to these. No one wants to put their business next to these. So they tend to have either vacant lots around them um, or other contaminated properties. So if we can get these redeveloped, we can basically, you know, also, you know, generate economic engines. And in, in just in our first round of these grants, um, and this is in the time that the grant was still underway, so obviously this will keep happening, right? We've assessed these sites. People can now go out and develop them, so hopefully a lot more jobs will be created in the future from these. But just in the time of the grant, about 200 jobs were created um, through redevelopment of these properties, so basically getting these back into some functioning um, uh, sort of manner where a business is now on there um, and generating jobs. We assessed uh, 30 sites and over 120 acres of property. And we're actually starting a new round of brownfields right now, um, which includes the assessment part, but also has this component of a revolving loan fund. So if I'm someone interested in one of these properties um, that are usually really cheap compared to property normally in Cook County, um, 
but I know there might be environmental contamination there, and I, I'm a little worried about that risk. A bank won't necessarily give me a loan to clean it up. I don't have the money up front to clean it up. Um, we'll give a very low cost or zero interest loan to that company to get this property cleaned up and get them going. Um, and they pay it back to the government and then we reloan it back out. Um, so it's a really, we're hoping it's a really productive program and leads to cleanup of a lot of sites in Cook County. Um, so with that, we're gonna turn it over. There'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, that was a really high level view, really quick um, through some of our programs. So we can chat more in a little bit. Thank you, Chris. Uh, поки ставиться наша друга презентація, я коротко розкажу, uh, що ми далі плануємо. В принципі, я зараз uh, підсумую певне те, що сказав Кріс, і ми перейдемо до другого нашого раунду презентації. Це будуть презентації, які пов'язані і uh, більше питанням відновленої енергетики, питанням енергоефективності, енергозбереження. Зараз коротко розкажу про себе. Мене звати Андрій Наконечний. Я є кандидат юридичних наук, в минулому викладач. Зараз працюю державним експертом в секретарі Кабінету міністрів України. Але сьогодні з вами не як державний службовець, а все ж таки як випускник програми професійних обмінів, який стажувався в окрузі КУК. Наш проект називається Better Ways for a Better Future. Ви зрозумієте, чому. Отже, як ви бачите, Крісом показував організаційну структуру. Я покажу структуру департаменту в обличчях. Бачите? От, це мій керівник. Це мій керівник <сум> стажування. Власне, я розкажу про якісь такі певні цікаві речі, цікаві політики, які є в окрузі Кук в Америці, які можна було, в принципі, перейняти нам, можна було б чому повчитися. Тому, напевно, розкажу про дуже таку цікаву річ. Це є Forest Preserve. Це є такий дуже цікавий орган, який займається захистом власне, лісів, заповідників, зоопарків і так далі. Тобто всі зелені насадження, які є в районі округу, вони в підпорядкуванні цього органу, це Forest Preserve, який, от ви бачите, тут 28 тисяч гектар території, близько 62 мільйонів відвідувачів щороку, Дуже багато туристичних маршрутів, вони навіть водять гольф-клубами, центрами, пікніками. І це, власне, як я вже сказав, це такі певні землі природно-заповідного фонду, рекреації, зоопарки. Тобто це такі, все, що зелене, все належить до цього органу Forest Preserve. По площі це десь приблизно 10-15 відсотків округу, що насправді дуже багато в масштабах таких густонаселених округів. І вони чим не цікаві, тим, що вони проводять дуже-дуже багато цікавої діяльності. Це є і рекреаційна діяльність. Ну, за, по загальному, якщо по правовому статусу, то е, їхні землі є в загальному закриті для відвідування. Тобто, в принципі, є оці туристичні маршрути, або якщо там є зоопарки чи гольф-клуби, які, скажімо так, вільні. А в загальному їхні землі є в основному закритими для відвідування, тому що вони там, як правило, проводять якусь наукову дослідницьку діяльність. Е, і знову ж таки, що мене дуже сильно вразило, це те, що на відміну від України, де ви можете просто взяти своїх друзів е, машину і поїхати куди-небудь там на річку відпочити, так, з пікніком, там трішки не так. Тобто є чітко визначені місця, де ви можете відпочити. Тобто це там, я, якщо не помиляюся, в окрузі це 5 чи 6 місць. І знову ж таки, для того, щоб відпочити, вам потрібно отримувати, купляти дозвіл. От, і це, там, наприклад, для кемпінгу, для, там, якщо у вас дуже багато людей, якщо ви будете ночувати. В принципі, це, одна з, ця діяльність вона приносить дохід власне, цій організації. От, також це вже приносить дохід це надання послуг. Це от, гольф-клуби, зоопарки, прокат різного обладнання, як, наприклад, байдарки і так далі. Також не займаються збереженням і розширенням цих земель. Дуже цікаво, вони борються з інклюзивними видами, насправді. Тому що, знову ж таки, в зв'язку з глобальним потеплінням, дуже багато видів, які не проживали на цих територіях, починають там жити. Це і в фора, і фауна. І вони, знову ж таки, за допомогою цих коштів намають різні організації, які квадратик за квадратиком, за квадратним метром, за квадратним кілометром чистять землі, річки, озера від всіх різних інвазивних видів. І потім, знову ж таки, за це отримують кошти, що насправді дуже цікаво. Тобто, таке чистка таких територій. І, звичайно, це волонтерство, в них дуже багато волонтерів, і я навіть розкажу такі курйози, які були у зв'язку з цим. 
це те, що в Америці взагалі волонтерство дуже сильно поширене, і ми, наприклад, у нас було одне з завдань це знайти, це поволонтерити на протязі місяця, ну, тобто там один-два рази. І скажу, що це було дуже важко, тому що волонтерство було розписано тиждень наперед. Тобто для того, щоб бути волонтером, це не так, як прийти і все. Це треба реєструватися. В них є певна кількість волонтерів, так? вони там роблять певну роботу. Наприклад, там в зоопарку потрібно в суботу, в неділю 2-3-4 волонтери, але не 20. І дуже важко було знайти місце для того, щоб поволонтерити насправді. І от в Forest Preserve у них була така проблема, тому що волонтери хотіли щось робити, хотіли допомагати, але дуже часто вони більше шкодили, ніж допомагали. Вони кажуть, давайте ми будемо боротися з інклюзивними видами, там, почистимо ці землі. Вони чистили землю, але в, ну, тобто від якихось рослин, але в кінцевому рахунку вони ламали інші якісь рослини, які були під там, червоною книгою, під, ну, під охоронною. Або вони це робили дуже неефективно. І тому була дуже яка боротьба з ними кілька років. І нарешті там, ну, через якийсь час був знайдений вихід з керівництва Форест Прозор, знайшов вихід такий, знаєте, такий баланс. Тому, власне, також було дуже цікаво в цьому плані. Ну, от бачите, от, ну, це Permits Opening Day, це вони от продають. На особливо гарячі дати, та, там, я не знаю, ну, тобто, дуже важко купити дозвіл на те, щоб можна було, власне, там, чи переночувати. Бачите, от купи, 10, купи, 10 ночі, купи 9 ночей, 10 отримай безплатно. Так, е, бачите, тут вони роз, е, розробляють різні туристичні маршрути це от для, для велосипедів, для ще щось, так, от це волонтерство. Ну, і в них дуже багато заходів, багато з них, які є вільні, деякі коштують певні, певні суми, що також приносять таким організаціям прибуток, що насправді дуже круто. Е, давайте ми питання і відповіді трошки залишимо на кінець, добре? Е, Дуже цікава програма, яка мені сподобалася ця літ, вона є така більш загальнодержавна. Це програма, яка, програма сертифікування будівель, це є програма по енергозбереженню. О, тобто це є програма, яка для того, щоб досягнути рівня енергоефективності існуючих будівель на новобудов. Так? Тобто це є певна система із ранговими показниками, яка, власне, була започаткована НГО, але вона дуже багатьма штатами вона використовується як одна з програм. Так? Тобто це стало одним із кроків для того, щоб будинки стали нові і старі, стали більш енергоефективними. І які переваги цієї програми? Це є престиж цієї програми, доступність, зрозумілість і простота використання. Тобто раніше було тільки три оцих значки. От, е- які, ну, тобто дивіться, програма як працює? Є отут шкала така, тобто є різні типи будинків, бачите? які сертифікуються, є певна шкала, яка, з якої ви набираєте бали. В залежності від вашого типу будинку, в залежності від того, що ви там встановлюєте, які ви заходи робите, і в залежності від кількості балів ви набираєте собі таку медальку, яку ви можете повісити на будиночок, показати, що ви дуже крутий. Так? Тобто, що... тобто це як засіб, е... засіб ну, привлечення скажімо так, інвесторів для того, щоб... Для того, щоб люди бачили, що ви, там, у вас будинок енергозбережений, що він дуже-дуже там, еко-френдлі. Це, насправді, дуже круто, і воно в багатьох випадках дуже працює. Це дуже престижно, насправді. Також це різні екологічні програми. Це, ну, знову ж таки, роздільний збір сміття. Ну, ми вчора трішки говорили, ви можете подивитися запис по збору сміття. В принципі, не, не все так добре, але тим не менш. Дуже цікава програма, яка є, це екодружні стікери і наклейки. Це Кріс також трішки вчора розказував. Це, знову ж таки, дуже класно, тому що воно показує, наскільки бізнес еконфрендлі. Наприклад, бізнес робить роздільні збір сміття, або цей бізнес, там, наприклад, ці ресторани не використовують ці трубочки пластикові і так далі. Тобто це, насправді, нічого не коштує, але коли ви йдете біля якогось ресторанчику і бачите цю наклейку, чому б не зайти, якщо це екодружній ресторан? Ну, чому б не додаткова мотивація? Це збір відходів після різних великих свят. Тут, наприклад, це моя хост-мама. І, знову ж таки, була проблема, що робити з тими всіма гарбузами, які після Хеллоуіна, наприклад, залишаються. І в тому ж, наприклад, я був в Оук парку районі, і там дійсно були такі місця, де можна було людям здати ці гарбузи. Я не знаю, вони там використовували, наприклад, як наші ялинки. Так? Тобто це дійсно дуже крута програма, яка насправді суттєво зменшує після таких подій відходи, але це теж дуже мало чого коштує. Волонтерська активність, як я сказав, і те, що дуже багато функцій державних передаються на НГО. Про це нам розкаже більш, напевно, Елізабет, тому що вона в такій організації працює. І дуже багато функцій якби, делегується. Тому що НГО не ж краще знають, що хочуть люди. Ну, в багатьох випадках. Так? Тобто, які запити у людей. Чому б їм не делегувати якісь певні функції? Ну, це вчора, з вчорашньої презентації по відходам. В принципі, якщо вам цікаво, можемо до цього і вернутися сьогодні трішки також в ваших питаннях. От, е, я ще коротко розкажу, що мені дуже цікаво сподобалось. Це 
по стічних водах якісь також яка ситуація, тому що в Чикаго була дуже важка ситуація в зв'язку з забрудненням озера, так, і вони утворили так званий санітарний округ Чикаго, цей Water Reclamation District, е-м, прорили канал, який відводив ці всі різні кан- каналізації, стічні води, побудували дуже багато станцій, одна з яких це стікні, яка одна з найбільших станцій переробки, і під Чикаго вирили дуже-дуже великий глибокий тунель, який має діаметр в районі 10 метрів, Ну, уявіть собі, 10 метрів діаметр труби каналізаційної і 200 кілометрів там по Чикаго округу Кук. Бачите, тут дуже-дуже багато різних моніторів. Це на цій станції стікни, які я був, яка контролює все. Тому що бувають такі кризові моменти, коли дуже багато штормової води, дуже багато одночасно, і треба це все контролювати. З цього глибокого тунелю це все закачується на грубу переробку, біологічну переробку, і до вас на цей тунель. Також вони окремо відділяють органічні відходи, які йде на сміттєзвалища по переробці органічних відходів і виробленню компосту. Виробляють вони різні нітрати для удобрення. І, власне, слоган цієї е, з фабрики, це є Better Ways for Better Future, що, власне, є частиною слогану нашої програми. От, тому, в принципі, тепер ви вже знаєте все. Е, а зараз на цьому у мене все, і я хочу перейти до нашої другої частини, до нашого наступного спікера, це Елізабет Джадсон. Вона є керівником програм в Elevate Energy, вона трішки більше вже розкаже про себе. От, тому вітаємо. Good evening. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, This is my first time to the Ukraine and my first time to Eastern Europe, so this was extra special for me. Um, Again, my name is Elizabeth Judson. Um, I'll share a little bit of my background with you guys so you understand my perspective. Um, Once I figure out the clicker. Okay, so a little bit of my background. Um, I started out of a technical background. I have an undergraduate and a master's degree in engineering. Um, And then I went and got a master's degree in business. Um, so I, I like to take those two, the technical and the business side of things, to try to move the agenda of clean energy forward. Um, so I've spent the first 20 years of my life, I, my energy progression personally has been similar to most governments. Uh, so I started out working for British Petroleum for 20 years. So started out in fossil fuels, the big, bad, ugly oil company. We then progressed to clean, uh, clean energy, moving to natural gas. And then finally, I made the transition over personally to a passion for renewable energy. And if you look at most countries, especially developing countries, that's the similar path and journey uh, that communities uh, and governments go through. Um, I had the good fortune of spending time in working with the governments in China and Indonesia, a little bit in uh, Italy. And uh, recently, in the last year, I returned to my home of Chicago, um, where I switched from the private sector And now I put on my halo, and I work for a a a not-for-profit where we focus on uh, clean energy access for all. Um, So that's a bit of my background. Um, So again, Chicago is a bit similar to Kiev. Um, It's based on a lake, so I like the water mass there. Um, I've enjoyed uh, kayaking on your river here. Uh, My favorite part of the city is that the best part of Chicago is along the lakefront is very green, and it's a public park uh, meant for the people. Very similar to many of the parks that I see in Kiev. Uh, I went for a morning run and really enjoyed your botanical garden. Um, so very similar, um, uh, both climate-wise um, and just the environment. So, um, let me move on. Let me talk a little bit, um, if I could. I could talk without my presentation if we prefer, but let's see. Here we go. Um, So again, the not-for-profit that I work for, the mission is uh, to promote smarter energy use for all. So what that means is, um, as far as smarter, we give people the resources they need to make informed decisions. So this is educating the community in particular so they can continue on their journey, similar to my own journey, from fossil fuels to clean energy. Next part is we design and implement programs that reduce cost, protect the environment, and protect people. Um, So I'll get into a few of those programs uh, shortly. 
And then lastly, uh, we ensure that the benefits of clean and efficient energy use reach those who need it most. Um, so we have a particular term that's been developed in recent years um, in English that's environmental justice uh, regions. And what we mean by this is typically the geography of where you were born is a predictor to your health, your life, and your socioeconomic status. We would like to eliminate that predictor and make it equal for all. So for example, very heavily industrial communities typically have low socioeconomic uh, people that live there and they have poorer health and poorer access to clean energy. So my company is dedicated to making sure that those regions come along the journey of transitioning to clean energy. So a few examples of how we do that exactly. Um, in particular, here's kind of um, the highlights of what my company does. Um, and there's a few things that are compelling in particular. So if you kind of look over here, um, I may be a rebel and just stand up. Um, so if you look over here, this is the amount of CO2 that we've saved. So this shows you how environmentally friendly we are, right? Um, up here it shows the number of homes uh, that we have retrofitted and made more uh, energy efficient. So that's about 35,000 residents who now have cleaner uh, and reduced energy bills than they did before. Um, we have some electricity savings, around 22 million kilowatt hours. Um, and then we have jobs. We've created 635 jobs. Um, so part of what my company does is in particular really focus on working with governments to develop effective policies. And so when you're working on effective policy, you've got to bring a lot of people along. You've got to bring along the government. You've got to bring along the private sector. And you've got to bring along the community. So a lot of times it's difficult. You have to understand what motivates people. Uh, some people are motivated by improving the environment. We have a few laggers who don't really believe in climate change. Or, okay, they may believe in it, but they have bigger hardships to worry about, right? So that's not gonna bring everybody along. A lot of people like money, okay? People like saving money. When you have a family budget and you're trying to put food on your table, saving money is really important to you. That's also what drives the private sector. The private sector is financially driven. So you need to develop policies that have financial implications that are of benefit to. That's how you get the private sector to be involved. And then jobs. Jobs are a really big piece. This is where you get your politicians involved. If they have an election coming up in a few years, a re-election, they want to be able to stand up and say, look at the number of jobs I've created in our community. That's a big deal for them. And that's something that everyone can see and understand. It's a little harder when they point to, hey, I helped save the environment a bit. It doesn't always translate for people. Uh, but again, this, if you have create 635 jobs, that's 635 families that now can put food on the table that previously were not able to potentially. So again, this also resonates in the community. This gets the community interested in getting involved in clean energy. So something that we did recently in Illinois is we created policy that has those three components. It helps the environment, but we made sure there was a financial component that saved money to get the private sector engaged, and also the community, because they wanted to save on their electricity bill. But then we also ensured that jobs were created. That helped politicians be able to speak to their community as to why they were behind this legislation. That's also why we had families uh, and individual communities that were on board too on these. So typically, if you really want to move an agenda uh, around environmental sustainability, it needs those three components and help the environment, save money, and create jobs. And that's how you get, create, get things to move. So this is my home of Chicago. Um, and we have um, what I call a healthy competition. This helps sometimes with environmental uh, sustainability agendas. So our state of Illinois came out with um, a mandate that they wanted to achieve 100% renewable energy by the year of 2050, um, which is a really good goal. Uh, but I'm proud that my hometown Chicago stepped up and said, we want to do better. <laughs> so they came in and said, we're going to achieve 100% renewable energy by the year of 2040. Now that's a little bit easy for a politician in the year of 2018 to stand up and say, 2040, I'm going to bring in 100% renewable energy. They won't be in office then. They won't. So it's a little easy to commit to something that's quite far out. 
Um, so one piece also in making sure we move the agenda is to make sure we have intermediate milestones that keep us honest, yeah? Um, so again, um, in particular, I wanted to talk about um, this new um, legislation that we came out with called the Future Energy Jobs Act. So again, even in the name, let's focus on marketing. What word is in there that pops for everyone? Jobs, everyone likes jobs. The government likes creating jobs, communities like having jobs created, and private sector too. When they create jobs, it means they're in a growing business. So again, even the title of this legislation, it's an environmental bill. Um, and again, a sustainable bill. But again, they focused on the jobs because that got everyone excited and everyone could kind of get behind it. Um, I wanna point out a few of the features though of what makes this compelling. Um, so in particular, uh, we had the commitment um, that by 2030, again, this is an intermediary milestone, right? Um, by 2030, there's a mandate that the two main utilities in the state of Illinois have to reduce their electricity usage that they provide by 21% and 16%. That's a big deal when overall energy demand is increasing. So in the next 11 years that we have left here, they need to reduce um, energy demand by 20 and 16%. Um, and that's a big deal because what that results in is about $7 billion of savings for individual residents and businesses on their electricity bills. So again, this is the saving money piece, right? So let's reduce our energy demand and what that means is money in the pockets for businesses and residents. Oop, wrong direction. Oh, and we're gonna turn it off again. Can someone undo what I did maybe? <laughs> if not, I'm just gonna keep talking, it's okay. <laughs> so let me see, okay, I get it now, here we go. Um, another important aspect was regarding renewable energy. There was a, com a component called Illinois Solar for All. So this brought community solar, and in particular, there's a component that focused on these environmental justice areas, areas that typically lag when it comes to clean energy. Um, and what this did in particular, the reason why that's a big deal is uh, by investing in community solar, it lets those who typically couldn't afford it participate. So what happens is, if I live in a high rise, like I see a lot of residential buildings in Kiev that are skyscrapers, similarly in Chicago, if I live in a skyscraper, I don't have a roof to put solar panels on. Um, or I may not have, even if I am in a home, I may not have the money to buy solar panels. So what community solar does is it lets a developer come in and they may take um, a large government building, they may take a large school, or even a brownfield site that used to be contaminated, they can change, they can put a solar farm on that, and a community solar, and what the community can do then is subscribe to that. They can invest a little bit of money, whatever size money that they have, um, and as a result of that, they get the benefits of that uh, power, and that clean energy, um, and the way that this was structured was to make sure that for environmental justice areas, that there was zero money up front, and that it guaranteed that the costs on a monthly basis for the community solar were maximum half of the financial benefits of the power that they were buying. So it makes financial sense for them, okay? But again, this was a carve out example of making sure we can get the whole community involved and give people access to renewable energy if they may not have otherwise. Um, another aspect of this um, was around renewable energy. So another intermediate step, right, is that um, there was a mandate that 24% of our power will come from renewable sources of wind and solar by the year of 2025. That's not very far off. So that's a really good mandate that's actionable and has line of sight and accountability to it. Um, and the reason why this is kind of a big deal is that it results in $15 billion worth of investment that's sparked by this mandate. And investment means jobs, right? It also gets the private sector involved because this is something that's required. It has to happen. It's a mandate. The utilities have to move on it. So again, it sparks um, business opportunities, so it gets the private sector involved, yeah? Um, another aspect is around jobs training. Again, that jobs word, right? 
Um, and the jobs training, the, um, this mandate uh, requ it had basically through grant money around $750 million to invest in jobs training, but also helping people uh, who are of low economic situations be able to afford their energy bills. Um, and what this does is essentially in order to apply for the jobs training, it is very specifically targeted, again, to those environmental justice areas and for people of low economic ability. Um, so these are oftentimes are people who are unemployed and the government is already subsidizing and taking care of, either through subsidized housing or potentially helping with food. Um, so this is helping lift that population out of poverty. It's giving them jobs training in a field that is a growing sector where they'll have a secure job for years to come. So again, those three components um, of good for the environment, saving money um, in investments, and jobs training are what made this legislation something that was compelling and made it relatively easy to pass. Although it took, um, it took our company um, about two years of negotiations between the government and the private sector and the general communities to get this legislation put together. I think in the scheme of things, two years for something this uh, progressive is, is probably pretty impressive on the shorter side of things. But again, it was knowing what motivates people and knowing what motivates your audience in order to move it along. Um, I'll touch on two programs really quick that, okay, so this was the legislation I talked about. So the question is, okay, so how about that? How do you go about doing that? Um, one piece in particular, and I like this opportunity because I see it as a good potential for the Ukraine, um, is an energy efficiency uh, program. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm giving our translator a real run for her money tonight. <laughs> but this energy efficiency program, basically it requires the utilities um, to collect um, extra money from customers on their utility bill. So everyone pays uh, less than 1% addition on their utility bill. It's so small. My friends, neighbors, family, they have no idea they're paying into this program because it is really tiny. It's 1%. Um, but by collecting from everyone, it results in tens of millions of dollars. And the utilities are required for all the money that they collect in one year, they have to reinvest that money within a year in energy efficiency programs for the public and private sector. So they collect this money um, and they go out and they have these energy efficiency programs. So what this means is um, I can call up um, to one of these programs and say, I'd like you to come out to my house and give me ideas on how to be more energy efficient. Say, if energy efficient. So a group comes out, they do an assessment, they look for opportunities. It may be changing light bulbs, it could be um, insulating piping, it could be changing out my boiler, uh, for example, for something more efficient. They show me the report. The majority of it is totally free to implement, but I, as the homeowner, I get to choose what I would like done to my house. And on average, people save about 20 to 30% of their energy bill by participating in this free program. Um, so this is one way, again, where um, the construct from the government on the legislation, the government did not have to invest, but instead the utilities collected like I said, less than 1% additional fee in, ut in utility bills and created this program. And then lastly, um, the other one I'm gonna touch on is again the community solar. Um, so here's an example of taking um, roof space that's available um, and installing and then the surrounding community can, subscri can subscribe into that and have the benefits of clean energy. Um, and here's a quote from the local um, legislators. This is a group that was trained on how to install solar panels. Um, so this is part of the jobs training uh, benefit there. We have a quote from the local mayor um, saying that he was basically really proud that jobs came to his community. Um, this is a class of 20 people, again from low economic background, and were lifted out of poverty. And at the very end of this, uh, my company puts on a job fair. So we invite our contractors that do the solar installations 
and also our contractors that do energy efficiency. And we have our class of trainees come, and we're proud to say that 95% of our class of um, new job seekers, uh, newly trained, are employed by the end of this. And again, it's just a mechanism for creating jobs, particularly for those who didn't have jobs to begin with. So I hope that's helpful, and maybe you learned a few things, and you can ask some questions later. And I think we're on to Alicia, although I don't know where she is. She's far out. Sorry. All right. Отже, зараз нас наш наступний вектор, я так розумію, трішки у нас просто такий насичений графік, тому наш наступний вектор трішки прихворів. От, тому давайте поки що, щоб не витрачати даремно час, перейдемо, може, до наступної секції. Як тільки Олеся повернеться, ми також послухаємо її. Вона також має дуже цікаву презентацію. Олеся також випускниця програми PFP осінньої сесії, яка також займалася як питаннями відновленої енергетики, питаннями енергозбереження, а в штаті Орегон. От, тому, якщо у вас зараз є питання до, власне, трьох спікерів, які ви сьогодні почули, то прошу, так, мікроф, мікрофончик, так, Заді вас. Можна на русском? А я би хотіла узнати, як обстоять діла з атомними відходами. Я знаю, що воєнні експериментують ну, з атомною енергією, і, власне, відходи вони прячуть десь під землею. І, учитывая те, що які змінення відбуваються з нашої планети зараз, те, що двигаються тектонічні плити під землею. Ось так? О, все, є. <laughs> вот. а, я знаю, что тектонические плиты двигаются, и вот это движение, оно вызывает, а, ну как это сказать, вот эти вот отходы, которые под землей лежат, то есть они могут взорваться вследствие движения тектонических плит. И меня очень волнует, как решается этот вопрос, что с этим делают или планируют делать. Um, so I can't speak to a lot of that. There obviously is quite a bit of nuclear waste in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, I, <laughs> I, I don't have much information on that question. Давай там тоді наступне питання і повернемося до нашої останньої спікерки. Чи не могли підняти руку, щоб, щоб я бачила до кого? А, так, так. що це, це питання воно робиться федеральними власне, структурами, а Крісін працює в департаменті округу трошки нижчого рівня насправді, і тому в нього немає такої скажімо, так, інформації про це питання, на жаль, але я думаю, що якщо що, то в принципі може поцікавитися. Да. Так, є question? Okay, yeah. How will uh, fossil fuel industries, uh, how do you guys think they will react with the change to renewables? Will they also shift? What do you think their plan is? Thank you. No, good question. Thank you. Um, I guess I can use an example. Um, you know, in the U.S., in the state of Texas, that is our classic oil country. Right, um, that's where um, all of our big oil companies are based, um, and it's a it's a state that was developed off of oil. Um, but I can tell you that today the fastest growing wind farms are in that same state. Uh, so, um, as technology advances for renewable energy, again, people are motivated by different things. Um, but in that oil rich state, there's a reason why they have uh, wind power. And that's because it's financially advantageous. That's why the private sector has developed there. You can also look at Saudi Arabia. They have a huge um, solar arrays and solar farms there. It's because it's financially advantageous. It also, it brings in a mix of energy sources. The other thing that um, motivates from a political standpoint also is uh, people like renewable energy either because it's good for the environment. Second, it's a good investment. But three, it also helps with energy security. So that's another motive as to why countries in general, they, they like a mix of opportunities for their um, energy sources. It al also lowers the market rate for electricity. Um, so that's a benefit to everyone. 
Окей, thank you, Озбіт. І я хочу представити нашого останнього спікера, Оесю, також випускник програми. Так, у нас такий просто насичений графік цей останній тиждень, що просто а, дуже легко вибити цей з колії. Добрий день, я представляю Міністерство екології та природних ресурсів. Я була на стажуванні в Орегоні, в штаті Орегон, який знаходиться на північ від Каліфорнії. Він є такий, же, такий самий прогресивний, як і Каліфорнія. У сенсі стало, стало горозитку, стали енергетики та поводження взагалі з енергією і чистою енергією в тому, в тому числі. Тобто сам, сам штат Орегон, він його забезпечує енергії один з найбільших виробників Bonneville Power Administration і там лише дві, дві компанії, які займаються постачанням електроенергії саме в Сейлені, де я була, це Портленд General Electric і Salem Electric. І вони цю територію ділять між собою і забезпечують, саме та компанія, в якій я була, 280 тисяч лічильників, вони забезпечують сервісом. Що вони роблять? Вони роблять програми для громад, дуже цікаві програми, у них їх дуже багато, там близько 20 ми нарахували разом з моєю колегою, яка була з Вірменії, вона теж займалася сталою енергетикою, і вони фінансуються з таких п'яти, можна сказати, бюджетів, це рахунки, потім щорічний бюджет компанії, рахунки отримані від встановлення лічильників або там їх, їх сервісу, від також додаткових donations, пожертв, так, від, від платників, від робітників компанії та від членів комітету, яка, яка опікується, який опікується компанією. Це загальна статистика по регіону, скільки там населення забезпечується електроенергією і загальне населення регіон мається на увазі Bonneville Power Administration, ця інституція забезпечує 8 штатів електроенергії, а саме Орегон штат, вони забезпечують на 31% електроенергії і загальний бюджет компанії там 4, можна по 4 мільйони доларів на ці всі статки і Саме цікаво, що 80% електроенергії, яка виробляється на цьому Бенгель Павла Адміністрична, це гідроенергія, 80%. І це дуже цікавий факт, тому що в Україні це майже, майже 1%, який покриває пікове навантаження під час виробництва електроенергії на атомних електростанціях. Тому, коли в мене виникало питання, чому у нас, ні, я задавала питання інженерам, чому ваша річка Колумбія може продукувати стільки енергії, а наша річка Дніпро не може, то вони казали, це все, все питання в потужностях, які там встановлені, просто вам треба їх змінити, і все. Далі, що стосується саме компанії, в якій я стажувався, сам Селем Електрик, вони мають дуже багато сервісів, в тому числі це вони палюють взимку населення, тому що в них немає централізованої системи опалення, в кожному будинку окрема система, і вони роблять спеціальні програми, які допомагають людям, у яких немає, наприклад, достатньо, достатніх коштів зробити ці роботи. І навіть вони адмініструють одну школу, яка вважається бідною, вони 60 тисяч доларів на рік виділяють на те, щоб забезпечувати електроенергію, проводити волонтерські різні змагання і на техніку, на комп'ютери. Тобто в них є такі кошти, і вони дуже активно залучають дітей до різних програм з енергоефективності, енергозбереження і... Це дуже такий цікавий момент, що електроенергетична компанія, вона опікується взагалі громадою, щоб там на краще, на краще розумілося в тому, звідки береться енергія, як вона витрачається, як її ефективно витрачати взагалі. І дуже багато в них 
Тобто все місто Селен, воно практично обслуговується цією компанією Селен Електрик. Вони знають кожного власника будинку і приїжджають для того, щоб перевірити лічильники. І в тому числі вони здійснюють такі, такі програми, як з встановлення сонячних панелей, і е, дуже, дуже активно ця програма в них використовується, тому що частину коштів, яку витрачають населення на встановлення панелей, е, покривається самою компанією електричною, а частина панелей е, покривається е, з штату, бюджету штату, тому що в них є окрема програма, е, яка заохоче населення виробляти чисту енергію, енергію сонця, оскільки в кожного, наприклад, платника податків, в нього є електронний кабінет, де він може, не податків, а кожного члена цієї електричної компанії, який використовує електроенергію звідти, є електронний кабінет, де він може просто відкрити і побачити, які кошти, на що витрачаються, і це ну, кожну годину там вся інформація вновлюється. І якщо стоїть, стоїть, наприклад, на даху електростанція сонячна, то там теж можна подивитися, як виробляється електроенергія, як вона, в які, в які проміжок часу її більше виробляється, які менше, і скільки взагалі в місяць. Всю, всю, всю цю динаміку можна відслідковувати просто за, використовуючи домашній кабінет, домашній комп'ютер. І що цікаво, що, наприклад, за ці кошти, які люди вклали у сонячні панели, вони отримують дивіденди у вигляді того, що в кінці року, коли починають підбивати підсумки, їм повертають кошти, які їх сонячня, сонячні панели виробили. Тобто це от в тій родині, де я мешкала, це було десь 3 тисячі доларів, їм повернулися кошти. Тобто вони себе забезпечили електроенергію, вони виробили для електроенергії для своїх електрокарів, щоб зарядити їх. І крім того, вони ще і допомогли е, зменшити вплив на довкілля е, цьому постачальнику енергії, оскільки вони звітуються у своїх звітах про виробництво зеленої енергетики, і для них це великий плюс. Тобто для них краще допомагати людям встановити ці панелі, аніж будувати е, ці станції е, власноруч. І, е, тобто в, це дуже, дуже така популярна в них тема. Е, і е, от щорічно вони... Е, Тут показано, скільки вони допомагають грошима різним громадам. І є ще в них такий центр, який теж є такою енергетичною установою. Вони кооперуються разом з Селем Електрик і виїжджають на різні мітинги для того, щоб населення більше заохочувати до, до а, більш енергоефективної, енергоефективної діяльності і енергоефективного а, сталого життя. А, а все, questions. Тобто а, там дуже багато було різних програм, про які можна окремо говорити, і ми зробили портфоліо, яке можна подивитися, і привезли його до України, але це просто треба м, час і бажання від громад, а, і від конкретних спільнот для того, щоб робити конкретні дії. Оскільки у нас є угода мерів підписана про енергоефективність, і вона найбільш, я вважаю, дієва, там є така, такий момент, що, що громади повинні створити інтегровані національні енергетичні кліматичні плани. І, наприклад, в штаті Орегон є такі плани, вони надавали нам методичні рекомендації, як створювати їх, і вони працюють, і на користь громади, на користь штату, і це дуже було цікаво відмітити, що таке взагалі є, і а, м, такий досвід було б дуже цікаво застосувати в Україні. Тобто в мене все з цього питання, з того, що достали сталого розвитку енергетики. Дякую, Леся. Ми трішки перетягнули наш час для презентації, але я думаю, що в будь-якому випадку, у вас буде ще більше питань, я на це щиро надіюся. Ви зможете до кожного з нас підійти, і ми якось подіємося контактами, досвідом, якимось, може, матеріалами. А зараз не соромтеся, задавайте свої питання, ми хочемо їх почути, хочемо почути багато. Прошу. Е, 
My name is Pavel, Chemical Group Consulting. I'm chemist. I'm chemist. Uh, but uh, my questions, uh, first of all, American colleagues. Uh, I have three questions. First, uh, what do you think about imposing of uh, carbon tax um, as a driving force uh, to decrease uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission totally? The second question is uh, about PV. Uh, panels. Uh, they are not immortal. Uh, their efficiency, efficiency decreases from year to year. And are there any technologies for recycling of these panels or any uh, research and development activities in this direction? And last question, especially for Eliz to Elizabeth, uh, what about uh, Last year, fires and extreme heat in California. Uh, I mean wines. You, you read that you are, are fine wines. Uh, uh, are Napa and Sonoma Valley <laughs> <laughs> deteriorated? And also, as I know, uh, in this winter, uh, polar vortex also uh, deteriorates some of wine areas in state. So I'll start with the carbon tax. Um, I think it would be great. I think it's not going to happen anytime soon in the U.S. It's certainly not going to happen in the next two years. Um, there might be some more opportunity for that after 2020. Um, but even then, I think it'll be a really hard process to push through. So I, you know, we have to look at other means to get this done, um, you know, encouraging businesses to do it, educating the public to do it. You know, we always tell people vote with your dollars. Um, so, you know, become knowledgeable about the companies that are actually doing good things for the environment and purchase with them. Um, it's really hard to educate the public on these things. I mean, you know, day to day life, people have other things to worry about their kids, their jobs. Um, you know, so many things. It's really hard to get people um, aware of this and, and to put it at the forefront. But um, I think as we continue to see increased effects of climate change, people are going to become more and more aware of this. I think it's starting to become part of the everyday psyche of individuals. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think a carbon tax is, is going to be something we're going to see in the immediate future. Um, I think based, at, at least in the U.S., and I think based on our politics, it'll be pretty hard um, to see even if um, the political party in charge changes. I don't think the change will be big enough to actually make something like that happen. Um, but someone you know, someone brought up last night the New Green Deal and, and what we thought of that. Um, and I think one of the things that's great about it is, um, you know, it kind of put this idea out there of like, well, we should just do these things. And people are like, well, those are crazy things. And then I was like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe some things aren't so crazy. And, and, you know, we're talking about it almost mainstream things that we weren't talking about a year ago. Um, so, you know, who knows? Things change fast. Um, on, you know, as we've seen in the environmental world, it's usually one catastrophe that leads to um, big changes. It's unfortunate that we'll probably have to have that catastrophe first for so something like this to happen. But, um, you know... I'm hopeful in the future we'll get there. Um, I'm going to send it over to Elizabeth for the other two. Um, it's a very good point on solar uh, panels because the heavy metals in them, you cannot throw them away, right? They need to be properly disposed of. Um, I'd say, realistically, the lifespan of the solar panel is around 25 to 30 years, so we haven't really had much urgency around making sure that we're ready for, we have the supply um, in, um, available to um, to take those and properly dispose of them and potentially reuse and extract those heavy metals because that is what will need to happen. Um, I think there are some um, solar panel recycling centers. There just aren't many because it's not a big demand yet. Uh, but to your point, that is very much a piece that um, is, is, is legislated. You, it's, it's not something that you can just throw away. Um, so I think in due time, though, at least um, in the U.S., I, I do. I am a firm believer in supply and demand of the private sector. You'll see businesses popping up um, that do that type of recycling as the demand is there. Um, once these solar panels start reaching their end of life, um, but to your point with the technologies today, um, 
every year that's getting better and better. But solar panels, when we in, um, install them now, on average, the payback is around seven years. Um, and it's just going to get better and better with the technology. Um, so at any rate, I, it is a very valid point. Every, In fact, someone was asking us earlier today saying, hey, solar panels are really bad for the environment, aren't they? They have these heavy metals in them. It was worth highlighting. E everything has uh, its uh, positives and its negatives, right? So on solar panels, the downside are the heavy metals. And they do need to be extracted at end of life. But I, I'm pretty confident that there'll be businesses out there that pop up that will do that recycling. And, and, if, and if I could add, I mean, all these environmental measures are incremental, right? When we moved to CFL light bulbs, there was concern about the mercury in the light bulbs um, and what we were going to do about that. And then a few years later, we're moving to LEDs, you know. Um, but the mercury coming out of those light bulbs was much better than the mercury that was coming out of the power plants. Um, so, you know, have we found a magic bullet yet that will solve all of our problems? Certainly not. Um, solar panels are a step in the right direction. Um, again, hopefully, you know, the less of these, you know, heavy metals and other materials in them uh, that we have to use if we can increase the lifespan of them. And, and a lot of the, the 25 to 30 years is what they're guaranteed for. We, you know, these might go longer than that. Um, we see increased efficiency of them pretty much every year. So they're better than the alternative um, using coal um, and natural gas. Um, but obviously they do have an impact too, just like every form of energy we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, the, your third question, these are all great questions by the way, um, regarding uh, the fires in California and also the polar vortex. Um, I, I think, as Chris mentioned, a lot of times it takes a catastrophe to get people's attention. Um, and the fact that those fires took place in on land that was so particularly valuable, <laughs> right? Uh, from a, both a real estate standpoint, um, but al also what very fertile lands and what was grown there. There were lots of job losses, um, large financial losses. Again, for people that are not overly believers in the environment, unfortunately, it does take a catastrophe that often moves people. Um, and the legislation around, um, you know, California is by far our most progressive state around environmental sustainability in the United States. Um, and there's, there's good reason for that, not only open-mindedness, but things like that catastrophe move people um, and express the urgency around addressing environmental hazards. Um, earlier today, one of the uh, government uh, ministry uh, deputies asked a question about, we had the um, luxury of um, the pleasure of going and, and visiting the Chernobyl site firsthand uh, this weekend, and he asked my opinion of that. And what it reminded me of when I was working for British Petroleum, um, I was working there at the time that we had our Macondo disaster in the Gulf of Mexico uh, with the oil spill that we couldn't stop. Um, and again, that's another example of a catastrophe. Um, and you're, um, it's going to get a lot of attention, and you need to turn around and take that lesson that you've learned in a very difficult way and turn it into a positive and force of good and going and visiting the Chernobyl site for me. Um, before I came here, there's a lot of international press around Chernobyl that wildlife is returning, which I found quite intriguing and I was excited to see that site then that I had heard a lot about when I was a small child. Um, but to go there and see how green it is, to see that wildlife is returning and the attention and the solar panels that are there now Again, it's a very difficult lesson to learn. We paid a very high price for that, just as we did with the fires in California, as we did with the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It, it behooves us to learn from those lessons and move ourselves forward along the journey for environmental sustainability. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Next up, Natalia. How can I be a volunteer in uh, forest uh, preserves? Ну, дивіться, можна знайти сайт Forest Preserve в Cook County. Ну, це я говорю конкретно про цей Forest Preserve округу Cook. І там, власне, навіть є окремі там їхні заходи і окрема колонка з волонтерством, де в них є своя окрема група, спільнота, і є заходи в них також розписано повністю по календарю, написано, де це буде і скільки потрібно волонтерів. І якщо є вільні місця доступні, так, якщо там не зареєструвалось дуже багато людей, тому що, як правило, на вихідні, 
дуже багато реєструється, а особливо з сім'ями там цілими реєструється, так, тобто, наприклад, дітям показати ще щось, то, в принципі, до вас зателефонують і скажуть, там, підтвердять реєстрацію, скажуть, де, коли, як, або ви отримаєте поштою, і яку, яку скажімо так, який активіті, яку діяльність ви там будете робити, з чим вона пов'язана. Це може бути різна діяльність, ми там, наприклад, бачили, що сім'ї з дітьми, вони приходили і робили такі земляні кульки всередині з зернятками або з різними деревами, і їх садили, так, тобто висаджували цілі сади, парки, тобто таким чином допомагали, допомагали робити, або знову ж таки, вони допомагали прочищати якісь туристичні маршрути, підтримувати в належному стані, допомагали рахувати птахів, звірів, так, наприклад, там ходили, рахували, тобто це все дуже цікава діяльність, і не на все, знову ж таки, у ем, персоналу у штату е, Forest Preserve є на це руки. Тому це також дуже-дуже класно і дуже багато чим може допомогти. Ну, так, в Америці, волонтер, як я побачив, волонтерська діяльність, вона дуже-дуже активно розвивається і ну, вона дуже активно розвинута. І взагалі оцей дух волонтерства, я казав, що дуже важко знайти вільне місце для того, щоб поволонтерити у цьому Чикаго. Це насправді для мене було дуже дивним, тому що я думаю, ну, ладно, два тижні я там походим, подивимося, і за два тижні найдуше, так, волонтерство. А насправді це було дуже важко. І мене це здивувало, що наскільки багато людей залучені до волонтерства. Я бачу також по Україні, що цей волонтерський рух, хоча він почав, ну, так, почав дуже сильно відроджуватися, можливо, не з найкращих подій, які зараз відбуваються в Україні, так? тобто піднесення волонтерського руху, а важливо також не втратити цю енергію, яка є, і направити її також ну, тобто в сірі русло, яке є це. І допомога не тільки екології, це допомога бідним, допомога тим, хто, може, потребує так, цього, цих речей. Це, ну, це можуть бути різні форми. Тому дуже класно також навчитися оцих речей. Можливо, більше комунікувати, можливо, робити там і цілі сайти з, волон... з повними зібраними волонтерськими активностями в Чикаго. Так? Тобто, є, можете туди, 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 виберіть дату, і там випадає список і там, з п'яти різних установ, куди ви можете піти. Тому, можливо, таким чином... <laughs> um, and if I could say too, if you want to get the attention of a politician, hold a volunteer event that a thousand people show up to. I mean, it really shows that people care about that particular issue. Um, and, and when they see people are interested, they become interested. So um, it's another thing. It's just, it's just an easy way to show public initiative. Um, people who come out and volunteer tend to be people who are concerned about issues, meaning they tend to vote. Um, so it's a really good way to get civically engaged as well as to do something to help uh, the environment or, or, you know, whatever social issue that you're working on. Ще будуть питання у вас? Так. Так, я прошу. I have Так, так. І мікрофон так, поближче. I sound engineer. I have a question about uh, bicycle situation because, uh, for example, I don't have car, but I try to use bicycle, but it's complicated here. It's very poor infrastructure. What about US, USA? How uh, government or maybe some private organization encourage people to use uh, bicycle? Because I've been a couple of times in US and I was shocked, like small uh, women use very big cars. Everybody uh, seems to have cars. So. so we do use our cars a lot. Um, I will say Chicago is expanding their bike infrastructure every month, every day, every year, um, adding bicycle lanes. My own, I live in the a suburb of Chicago. Um, we've just added several bike routes, um, something that would have been unheard of five years ago. Um, a whole bicycle task force was formed that actually looked at this. And again, another thing that got politicians involved, they started all of a sudden... 50, 60 people were showing up to these bike events that were happening in our city, and they're like, oh, wow, this is important to people. I better start listening to this. Um, in the city of Chicago, we have a program, Divi. So the bikes are in racks. Um, you can rent the bike. Um, it's for an hour. So it's basically, it's not for you to have a bike forever, but it's for you to get you know, to commute from one location to another. And these are located everywhere. You can't walk a few blocks um, in the downtown area without seeing one of these. So um, we're a very bike-friendly city. 
Um, along our lakefront, there used to be a white walking slash biking path. They've actually separated those. So now bicyclists can, you know, free flow basically all the way from the north side of the city um, to the south side unimpeded by walkers. Walkers also don't have to be worried about being run over by a bicycle. Um, so there's, there's a lot going forward in big cities as far as bicycles. Um, I've been in some other major cities. They also do something similar with the rental of bikes. Um, now we're starting to see the electric scooter um, craze is happening too. So I think bicycling is becoming a big thing. Um, it really still is something for people who live close to the city center um, as far as commuting in and out of work. But even our, our buses have bike racks on the front of them that flip down. So you can bike to a bus, um, put your bike on the bus. When you get off the bus, you grab your bike and go. So um, we've really done a lot of things and come a long way. You can bring bikes on our trains, not during rush hour. Um, but a lot of things have, have happened to make biking, you know, really promote it. If I can add to that, this also comes to uh, Andrew's point of volunteering in the U.S. Um, and healthy peer competition. Um, we also have a, a bike challenge that's a uh, bike to work week, which is getting ready to happen in a couple of weeks. And my company has won this competition for our category <laughs> for years. And the pressure they put on everyone to try to bike to work, try to bike to work. And I, 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 I take the train to work. But um, again, it raises awareness, right? So it's dedicating, it's, it's a volunteer organization that dedicates one week trying to get the community to at least bike part of their way to work. It raises awareness. And again, um, as Chris said, there's nothing like politicians seeing oodles of people out on their bikes to realize, hey, wait a minute, this is an issue people are interested in. I should consider taking that on my agenda to progress. Um, so it's another way that I think people make their voice heard is through volunteering. Um, and again, there's nothing like a healthy competition. Um, and the whole city comes out for this Bike to Work Week and companies sign up to compete with other ones to try to win the title. You don't win any money, it's just prestige, but it's just another example of how volunteering helps uh, voices be heard. Також дуже цікаво, я хочу сказати, що то також потрібно розуміти, що попит дуже часто породжує, що пропозиція, попит породжує пропозицію, так, і навіть у випадку з тим самим Forest Preserve дуже цікаво, тому що вони побачили, що є багато велосипедистів, які хочуть якимось чином проводити свій вільний час. Вони почав відкривати туристичні маршрути саме для велосипедистів, так, в цих різних заповідниках, в різних резерватах. І, знову ж таки, багато, велосипедистів, багато людей, які не користуються велосипедистами, бачать, що є інфраструктура для того, щоб вони могли це користуватися. Це круто, класно. Купляють нові велосипеди і це відкривають нові маршрути. Тобто, такий великий замкнений цикл, який потрібно почати, і він, розумієте, йде такої великої хвилі. І це, насправді, дуже круто. Тому це з такими маленькими, маленькими кроками, насправді, ми можемо багато чого змінити. Хоч не завжди про це знаємо. Так, дякую. Прошу питання. Дякую. Я, якщо можна, українською. У мене запитання таке. Я от бачила ваші Елізабет-презентації. Там ви робите дуже великий акцент на саме сонячну енергетику і вітроенергетику. От, те, що я зараз спостерігаю в Україні, дуже великий акцент робиться на біопаливо. І, ну, як на мене, це створює певні проблеми, тому що біопаливо – це воно потребує дерев... ну, постачання палива, власне, да, деревини. І це пов'язане з незаконними виробками і створює багато прецедентів для таких корупційних схем. А, от. У мене запитання для вас, чи, чи це просто як вибір вашої організації пропагувати ці саме джерела енергії, чи існує якась стратегічна стратегічний напрямок, тобто привілегії саме для сонця і вітру. От. Ну, можливо, можете якось це прокоментувати. Так, дякую. Sure, good question. Um, it's interesting that you asked that. When I worked for British Petroleum, um, I worked in their biofuels uh, division. Uh, and I also worked with the federal government on trying to create the renewable fuels uh, standard, um, which is trying to bring biofuels to the market. Um, there's a challenge with biofuels. Um, the source is either well, wood, as you mentioned, which is deforestation and bad for the climate. Um, but also, we were trying to use uh, sh um, uh, napier grass or um, sugarcane, essentially. But then you get into this food versus fuel, which is not a good uh, space to be in. 
Um, and, and again, you don't want to be taking food out of the um, land that could be used for agricultural purposes and shifting it to uh, biofuels. That's a tough um, argument to persuade people on. And it's for that reason that biofuels has not really taken off in the US. Um, a lot of it is corn-based, but again, it's food versus fuel. Um, and that's always a contentious topic. It goes back to what we were mentioning before of no energy source is perfect. They all have downsides. Um, but in the US, we've had difficulty in progressing the biofuels piece, again, because of that food versus fuel and the land use. And so it basically was backing out good agricultural land and putting it more, instead of food, putting it to biofuels. And it just hasn't taken off as a result of that, unfortunately. Um, so realistically, in the US, you see um, solar in particular growing, wind especially. They have technology advantages. Uh, wind is great um, because it typically is put up in areas where it's bringing extra income for farmers. So it's an added revenue source. Um, so again, it creates jobs uh, for farmers and everyone likes helping farmers, at least in the US. We have, we're very nostalgic of, we think of the mom and pop farmer. Um, so this is added income for them. And also it takes a very little um, agricultural space, right? Like the base of the windmill is quite small and they still can use their land for crops. So it's not um, displacing a lot of uh, expensive land. Um, but you'll find that the renewable energy sources that progress are because they're more financially viable, realistically. I hope that answers your question. Jeszcze pytanie, tak? Proszę, tam chyba się pierwsze było i przejdę do was, tak? So I have such a question. Uh, recently in Ukraine, it was banned to install a solar panel system on their land. So you can install it on the roof, but you can't install on their land. So I have such a question. Is it possible to do such a thing in U in the USA? So you can can you install, for example, uh, like we've just seen a solar uh, a solar panel tree on your uh, in your garden? So is it possible? Um, yeah, and a lot of it has to do with local zoning laws. Um, and we just talked about this earlier today with another group. Um, my town, for instance, a few months ago, you weren't able to put solar on the front of your house. Um, in fact, the rules said that your neighbor could not see it. And I don't know how you could put a solar panel on a roof of your house and not have your neighbor be able to see it. I mean, it was just that. Neighbor can't see it. It's like, well, from their window, from their where can they, you know. Um, and, and that just got changed. Uh, so, you know, we're moving forward on those things. This is coming, I think, pretty soon in the U.S. at least. It's going to be as common to see um, solar on a roof. It, it'll almost probably be odd not to see it, especially on a south-facing roof um, for us. Uh, you know, we had rules. It couldn't go on the front. It couldn't go on. It couldn't be ground-mounted. And those have gone away now. So, and, and we, we do have lots of, of ground-mounted solar um, projects, especially the community solar projects. Um, even our electric companies have ground-mounted projects. So it's, it's definitely possible. Um, I'm not sure the reason um, Ukraine's not doing it. It might just be an aesthetic thing. Um, they might also just be, you know, worried about is that the best use of the land? And that's certainly something to think about, you know. Um, but if, if a property's not going to be something else, why not? You know, we're looking at our old landfills, and why not put solar panels on top of them? Nothing else is going to go on top of there. Um, why not use that land? Um, there's actual special brownfield programs for those contaminated sites. You know, if it's a site that is just no one's going to clean this up, the expense is too high, well, hey, let's let's put solar on top. We don't have to dig into the ground. We don't have to disturb that contamination. Um, so I don't see any reason why it can't be possible. It just you have to get to the root cause of why someone has an issue with this, and a lot of times... Um, you know, it's a reason that really isn't reasonable when they actually think about it or somehow their fears could be alleviated or you can put some rules in place to work on whatever their fear is. I don't know if you have anything to add. I, I think it's public opinion. Um, I think first when people think of solar panels, if you're not real big on the environment, it's an eyesore. You don't want to be looking at that. And that's a lot of times where these limitations originally came from. But as it's more socially acceptable, um, the regulations loosen and, and progress. Thank you. There was a question, right? Yes. Please. 
My question is about uh, um, volunteer movement in, in America. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, what kind of uh, remuneration do um, American uh, volunteers have? Uh, as far as I know, Ukrainian volunteers uh, work for free meal. And uh, another question is, uh, supposing you a volunteer, but um, and you go to the forest uh, uh, to clean the forest, and um, supposing uh, poisonous snake um, bite you, who would take care of you? Mm. Do um, what kind of uh, legal uh, protection uh, American uh, volunteers have? Thank. No, thank you for the question. No, I'm just going Частинку відповім, напевно, я, частинку мої колеги трішки дадуть. З практично досвіду волонтерства я волонтерив в двох організаціях. Я волонтерив в так званий nursing house, це є для престарілих людей з будинок. В принципі, чому я волонтерив там? Тому що мій хостфадер, він також там постійно волонтерив. Це був одна з його місць волонтерства, він дуже багато де волонтерив. І, в принципі, це було досить цікаво. Ну, тобто, я нічого не отримував взамін, тобто, ніяких там їжі чи ще чим, щось. Це було просто незадоволення. І мені, в принципі, було цікаво розказати, поділитися якимось досвідом, послухати від людей, які трішки старші. Там був людина, який був 109 років, чи скільки, яка розказувала про війну там. Мені розказати про Україну також чимось поділитися. Це було цікаво. Друге місце, де волонтерів я, це була католицька школа, якщо не помиляюсь. Ми там допомагали трішки прибирати. Ну, да, в кінці нам ми, скажімо так, отримали якусь там водичку, там, так, щоб... Е... Е, тому, ну, тобто, отримали якісь певні е... там, продукти, так, ми кажемо, щоб можна було перекусити. Такі снеки ми отримали. Водичку, снеки. От. В принципі, це також було дуже приємно допомагати, і навіть е, без цих снеків, тобто, дуже приємно було подумати, що ви допомогли чимось тим дітям, які там вчаться. Тому, насправді, це було цікаво, було круто, а у випадку з Forest Preserve вони розказували, що, власне, вони ж супрово... оці всі волонтерські заходи, вони супроводжуються, професі... ну, професійні працівники, які там працюють, вони їх супроводжують. Тобто, ці лісники, еко-інспекторі, ці... лісничі інспектори, вони їх супроводжують і допомагають, ну, тобто, їх цим робити. Ну, може, лише Кріса або Ліза би щось додадуть по волонтерській діяльності. If I could give an example, I... today, in fact, my son, um, who is uh, 12 years old, his class at school is going to the beach to volunteer to pick up litter. Every month they volunteer. Sometimes they go to a nursing home for companionship. Sometimes they volunteer at a food pantry feeding the homeless. It's just a, a, a typical value that in America we instill. My personal opinion um, is that because America is very heavily capitalist, we're not socialist, there's a lot of social needs out there. And we rely on everyone helping out a little bit in some way. Um, but typically when my son and his class go to the beach, we call it a beach sweep where they pick up the litter. I think the school signs a waiver uh, with, with the city saying they know the risks of being outside and that they accept those risks. So if someone is stung by a bee or bitten by a snake, uh, no, the city is not held liable. Um, and, and we're the country that's known for lawyers, right? Who <laughs> look for every opportunity. I, I think people just kind of accept that risk, but uh, at most schools on a monthly basis, they're doing something to go out to volunteer in the community. Yeah, and again, it's usually you would sign a waiver saying that, you know, if I'm hurt doing this, it's it's my responsibility, not the organization. Um, for instance, the Forest Reserve, their volunteers are usually through friends of the Forest Reserve. It's a completely different organization that actually does the volunteer work in the Forest Reserve. So it's not the Forest Reserve itself actually going out and having people volunteer. It's a volunteer organization of people who just find it important to them to have this great natural resource in the middle of this urban area. Fortunately, we do not have poisonous snakes in the forest preserve, so we don't have to worry about that. But obviously there are, um, you know, there's, there's other dangers. And what we're asking these volunteers to do usually aren't things that, you know, should cause physical harm. Um, certainly you can get hurt doing anything. You might twist an ankle, something like that. But usually it's, you know, um, clipping, you know, invasive species, doing something to that, to that end. 
Так, дякую. Ми ще маємо час для питань. Так. Хто ще нас так бачить, такий активний? Так, прошу. Could you tell about payback period for solar panels, for example, private house? And another question, please. Um, how green are electric cars? I mean, uh, uh, recycling of batteries and other. Thank you. Really good questions. Um, so for the solar panels, I, there's a lot of that goes into it. What's your sun exposure? If you're in a location that has very good sun exposure, that's not obstructed. On average, when people invest in putting solars on their uh, solar panels on their home, the payback is around seven years in our area, for example. Um, you ask a very good question uh, around electric vehicles because a lot of people think electric vehicles equal great for the environment. It depends how that electricity is sourced. If that um, electricity comes from a power, uh, a coal, uh, coal um, power source, it's not that great for the environment, right? So electric vehicle is a step in the right direction, but you have to ask how that power, uh, what the source of that power was from. Was it from a renewable standpoint or at least natural gas? But a lot of times if it's from coal, eh, it's not as big of a step forward as people would like to think. Um, so that's a very good question and very valid question that um, people initially don't think about. Um, they just assume electric vehicles are fabulous. But again, you've, you've got to, Think about the power source from the utility. Thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions. Do you have any other questions? In such a case, I think that if we use practically all our time for our panel panel discussion, Я ще раз хочу щиро подякувати нашим спікерам Крістоферу Ліпману, Елізабет Джадсон, Олесі Шаповалові. Я е, неймовірно і дуже щиро дякую е, Америка Хаус Київ за те, що він за другий день уже вдруге нас тут хостить, за те, що надає нам такі чудові класні можливості для таких шикарніших дискусій. І е, дякую вам за те, що ви прийшли, за те, що послухали, за ваші питання. Якщо у вас є також щось додаткове, щось цікаве, щось нам розказати, можливо, або щось запитати таке більш особисте, підходьте, запитайте. Дякую вам.